Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, welcome to Quark Talk, kind of. This is Crystal here. And um, today my topic is about a disruption, like a disruptive thinker. What is one? Well, I'm one because today I'm going to reverse the lens and talk about myself in a way that pulls out and extracts really, really important uh, conversations about history. I wanted to share um, this documentary that I'm making, and I have Jay here because Jay is the ultimate kind of supporter of, of historical facts, digging, <laughs> digging into silent spaces. And so I think he should be interviewing me, and and so we'll kind of like just disrupt this whole situation and talk about it. Yeah, Jay. Let's disrupt each other. Okay, good. <laughs> Where do you want to start? I want to talk about your project at UH. You know, you you left us what was it, a year and a half ago or so, two years ago. And you went there, and I knew it was for a good reason, but I didn't know exactly what it was. Yeah. Why don't you tell us? Okay, so basically, um, this is uh, stemmed from my personal story of my grandmother who grew up in the deep south of Augusta, Georgia. Now, this, she's Chinese. So this is a Chinese family moving to the deep south, not just the deep south, but in the African-American neighborhood to set up grocery stores to cater to their needs. Why did they go to Georgia? So this is the historical thing that people don't know about. Um, long story short on the history of slavery, after that with the plantation owners and the, the, the white community would open up commissaries to serve, provide provisions for uh, black people and um, they didn't want to do it anymore basically. And so the Chinese who started coming in there thought, oh, this is a niche market, there's potential. So they brought all their kind of friends and family who usually were in San Francisco because most of the Chinese immigrants were there at that time. And so they brought them over. And so my great grandfather was one of those families who uprooted his whole family to go and from San do Francisco, that. which had its own issues. Yes, exactly. To Georgia, which had more serious issues. Yes. In terms of race. Yes. Uh, did they know at the time what they were getting into? <laughs> I don't think so. That's a great question. Because first of all, they what was their position, right? What was the Chinese position between a black and white binary? They didn't see beyond those two colors. They were either black or white. Yeah. And historically, I think in 1860s, there was a law that categorized Chinese as being white. And then like 10 years later, they changed it to being non-white. Oh, how interesting. Do, do you have any speculation about why the shift? It all goes back to the white supremacy, yeah? It's the, it's the threat of power. So if they see somebody as threatening their power, they will say, you are the other. But well, when it serves them economically, which is why they kind of embraced them in the beginning, they're like, yeah, be a part of us and help us grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me offer a thought. You know, this is Reconstruction in the South after the Civil War. It's a fair amount of bitterness on the people in the South, the whites. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as you say, they were developing the Ku Klux Klan. They were fighting sure. with Reconstruction. They were trying to find, uh, you know, a way to yeah. get leverage again. Um, and white supremacy sound like a great way to go. If the Chinese weren't white, they, they would naturally drift, yeah. you know, to, to con, you know, consider them black. Let me ask you something. What do you, where do you think the Chinese sat on the bus, on the segregated bus? Do you think they sat in the back with the blacks or in front with the whites? Uh, it depends on what, what period of time you're asking. We're talking 1930s because this is the time when they were there. Or which fountain did they drink from? That's easier for you. It's, uh, okay, it's well, I think it's easier for the white supremacists to say, sit with the blacks and drink from the black fountain. Okay, so you're wrong on both. Apparently, um, the, uh, so my grandmother's uh, sister's husband, who was a soldier at the time before the American army, um, went on the bus and he was in the, his uniform and he went to the back. And the bus driver saw him in uniform, so I guess he labeled him as American. And he said, soldier, you come back up front. So his position was blurred by who he represented. Sure. So he was in front of the blacks and perhaps behind the whites. Now, for the wa uh, water fountains, they sat, they drank from the white fountains, and they went to white schools, which is interesting. Interesting. I have some photos. I wanted to show you one. I uh, just, I mean, just an idea of the women, because I'm disrupting this with the perspective of the Asian women. It's not just the Chinese. So look, these are, this is the type of women, look, do they look American or do they look Asian? I mean, just their whole outer appearance to you. Well, they're Americanized, right. for sure. So they're very Americanized Asians. So they, did they represent America? I mean, that's where it's like blurred the boundaries of their identity. 
find yeah. it fascinating. But this is happening on the West Coast, too. Yes, and, yes. And, um, you know, they wound up in internment camps, the Japanese did. Oh, that's so. another good, interesting point. So when that time came during the wars, were you Chinese or were you Japanese? And sometimes if they misidentified you, they would actually select you mistakenly and, and take you away. And so they have all these kind of um, publicity things within the Chinese community and, and to educate the Americans that Chinese look like this, Japanese look like this. <laughs> we are not Japanese. Quick, quick start talking Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of crazy times. They were very unclear, their position. Were there Japanese in Georgia? I'm sure there were. But my focus on the dissertation was on this particular Chinese family, my grandmother's family, who grew up in that particular black neighborhood of Augusta, Georgia. Oh, so it's so interesting. This is really an interesting topic. And as you said, it hasn't been covered. Yeah. Okay, so we need to know mm, what, what kind of lives they led, what it meant to be sort of mm, black for some reasons yes. and, and, and white for other reasons. Yeah. <laughs> well, so let's break it down. Um, in the grocery store where they worked, um, they had the power, right, because they were the storekeepers. And how did they treat black people? You know, for me, I interviewed, I went to Georgia several times to interview both, both for this sides. this project. Yes, so well, I have. For you, good for you, um, And the black community would admit that there were some, you know, hierarchies within the colored realm. Um, and yet they agreed that sometimes they were discriminating, but at the same time, they were very um, sympathetic to their oppression. So, for example, when they didn't have enough money to buy food, they would let them go on credit um, because they knew they just didn't have the cash and they wouldn't be too calculating about that. It's, I have a it's story. It's good business, too. Yeah, see, okay, that's the thing. You understand the, the Asian mentality. Yeah. Chinese were pretty accommodating because for their, their own purposes. My great-grandmother didn't speak a word of English, and so when she gave credit to them, she didn't know how to mark down the items that they took first. And so she would just write a, a sum and write the word item. <laughs> so it shows, like, you know, it's okay, it's cool. <clears throat> were they successful in their effort at the grocery store? I think so, because the legacy was really when they started in the... Uh, they moved over in the late 20s, and then my grandmother uh, grew up there in the 30s. So get this, they're mostly girls. My grandmother's family, there were nine out of 11 of them were daughters. And so you imagine all these teenage girls running a grocery store in the African-American neighborhood, and the delivery boys were white. So I hear stories of like, <laughs> Flirting with the sure. white guy. <laughs> Things were blurred in that way, too. Yeah, what about that? I mean, it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, Asian women um, are, are very attractive to Howley men in the South, I guess. Ah, Orientalism, and, right? Hmm? Orientalism, like Orientalism. yellow fever. Okay, well, you know, it's an aesthetic thing, I guess. Okay, you married to an Asian. It's also a racial thing. So, uh, you know, how, was, was there, mis, mis, what do you call it, miscegenation? Miscegenation was actually the law against interracial marriage, and yes, there was. And so um, I have two uh, relatives who married interracially. I think I have a picture of one. Um, it's my uncle, who is my grandfather's, the other picture of this. Uh, yeah, so that's my Uncle Walter. Um, he's my grandmother's youngest son, brother, and that's his wife, his first wife, and their mixed race uh, daughter, Andrea. Now, when he got married, they had to go across the state to North to Carolina. Get or, yeah. What state did they go to? I believe it was South Carolina across the way, which was legal, strangely mm -hmm. enough. What year was this? Um, this was ago. probably in the, he was younger, so it was probably in the early 50s. That's not that long ago, actually, yeah. You know, miscegenation laws did not um, get abolished till 1967, I think it was. That's really it's not really, that long ago. No, I not. was born already. Is that scary or what? <laughs> so, but was there, you know, if, aside from the laws that, that, you know, used to put you in jail, um, yeah. what, what about the, the way people treated uh, um, a Hapahali couple? Yeah, so I interviewed my, my cousin, that little girl in that photo, and uh, she said because her dad's store was in an even more sketchy kind of ghetto area. It was like the equivalent of the projects today. And so she had black friends because she grew up in that kind of com community. And, uh, but when she went out to play with white kids, the parents wouldn't let their kids come to her house, but she could go to their house to play so that the parents would watch her. But for what reason, right? What was the fear? Racism. What was the fear of that, though? 
I don't know. You know and, and the funny thing is, uh, I'll tell you a short story of my own. Oh, you know? please. When I was in the service, I represented a, a, a black, I was a Coast Guard, a black uh, accused. And so I decided I was going to go to his uh, town and see his family for purposes of ex establishing who he was on extenuation and mitigation in, in the, in the court-martial. So I went to Greensboro, yeah. North Carolina. Yes, yes, yes. A very nice city. And, you know, I thought, I mean, I had my biases, I suppose. I thought that I was going to wind up in a black slum in that city. Wrong. It was middle class. And the houses were neat and clean, and people were living nice lives, and they cared about their families. And they had, and this was in uh, the, in the 60s, in okay. the 60s. And, Civil rights uh, they, time. They right? were having a nice life. They were respectable. They yes, were educated. Educated. They cared. They had all the right social structures. Right, right. I was very impressed with that. And I yeah. realized that we walk around with these, you know, historical biases and we think, um, you know, that um, that everything's a ghetto. It's not. Exactly. And, and there may be, you know, racial things. And, and we saw a voting, for example, in Georgia. That was awful, um, yeah. you know, a, a few weeks ago. But, but, right. but the How reality... How do you feel about that, by the way? How do you feel? Did you, were you rooting for her? I think her? it's disgusting. Okay. With a capital D. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I hope Abrams, you know, is able to elevate herself I think politically. Will. I think she will, too. Yeah. She's a hero, a heroine. Yes, yeah. yes. So anyway, uh, so, I, you know, I, I think that people, um, you know, have the wrong perception of the way a lot of these black communities, um, you know, are, are, are uh, developed. Yes. And even back in the 30s and the 40s, uh, they were perfectly reasonable places to live. Um, and, um, and and it was the people were friendly. It was warm. There was there was no there was no racial hatred going Actually, on. It was more, not from the black community was, anyway. Yeah, there was more amiable kind of atmosphere then than there is now. Ironically, during the segregated times, because people kind of like just did their own thing in their own pockets of communities, and they didn't have those you know sensitivities of, of assumptions. It's a few. It's a few old hanger on or people who were the racist yeah. people. And sometimes they're in positions of power, as yeah. in Georgia. Um, but, but did you, you know, see the book? I mean, sorry, the film recently um, called *The Green Book*. Yes, I did last week. Good, fabulous, Absolutely fabulous amazing. movie, fabulous movie. But you think about that. People don't know about this part of history that they had a book to show um, African American people where to stay in the segregated areas where their lives were literally in danger because they were black. Yeah, that's a very uh, a good. Um, a good historical review of yes. how things were in those days. Yeah. The year was 1962. Right. wasn't that long ago. Exactly. A and fair amount of racism. I love the way it worked out, though. Yeah. And the, and <laughs> Go the flipping. see the movie. See, that's disruptive <laughs> thinking. It's, it's a reversal of the lens. Yeah. It's like, why are you assuming that all black people are uneducated and dangerous? Yeah. You know, I love the scene in the car when he's eating the fried chicken and he doesn't know how to eat the fried chicken with his fingers. <laughs> but speaking of fried chicken, so when I went down to the South, I went there and the first thing that my Chinese Georgian Southern Bell family uh, gave me to eat was fried chicken. I said, is this all you eat there? And they're like, pretty much. <laughs> so I was, I was so hoping for them to kind of deconstruct that, uh, you know, stereotype. But no, they ate that. They had black eyed peas for me. They had collard greens. <laughs> they are Chinese, but they're a Southern. You might as well get used to it, yeah. So, well, you know, how did the Chinese react to that? How did the Chinese react to the racism? How did yeah. the Chinese react um, to the, you know, the problem of miscegenation and so forth? Um, how did the Chinese react to the way the, the, way the skinheads were Ooh. treating them? Yeah. How, how did the Chinese react to the blacks, their relations yes. with the blacks? And that's my whole exploration in my documentary. So how about this? With that loaded question, let's take a quick breather break. I think I need some water before we come back <laughs> to that happy topic. But don't go away. We'll continue talking about the concept of the position of the Chinese within the segregated South and what it says about a whole concept of racism and the historical representation. Don't go away. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us, Aloha. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea 
is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hi, welcome back to Quok Talk. I'm Crystal, talking about the Chinese in the segregated South. And the theme today is disruptive thinking because sometimes you need to kind of pick apart what is represented and look at it from a different angle. And today we are. And Jay's my great co-host today, talking about this juicy subject. You asked me a question. I have a question, question for you. Yeah. Okay, how did, how did the Chinese react to the racism, you know, to the extent they experienced it uh, from the, the, the white community? And how did they react uh, to the blacks? Um, uh, I'll break it down. Let me ask you first about how they reacted to the whites. Were they angry? Uh, were, would they, they feel, uh, you know, imposed upon? And to what extent? And how did they express that? Well, you know, they went to white schools and they drank from the white fountains and they sat with the whites. So they think they're on the privileged uh, color line. And yet they were discriminated within the white groups. I mean, but they don't want to openly admit that. Nobody wants to feel discriminated, right? And so by privileging themselves against black people, it made them feel better, I think. Uh. I interviewed this one guy in my film, and he actually said it. He says they played, they meaning maybe white supremacy, they played the, the, the Chinese against the blacks so that they were a little bit better than the blacks, and they played the Chinese against the whites, where the whites were a little bit better than the blacks. So it's all this hierarchy. Oh, the old uh, uh, the, color line. It's the yeah, color the, line. Yeah, the, the, the dividing people. Yes. And polarizing. Yeah. Them. So by associating themselves with white, they didn't feel they were on the other side. Of they weren't the other. Yeah, very tricky business. Yeah. I, I probably subconscious. I, you know, it probably wasn't an a, a, an express strategy. An ex Explicit right, strategy right. was just what people it was implied did. and it was embedded in, yeah. in the structure of racism. And your question about how they felt about black people, when I started interviewing my family, they, they, their answer was, you know, I just didn't think much about it. So is that a denial or an ignorance or, or why is there a lack of awareness well, of that discrimination? Be, it's a classy answer. It's a classy answer. Like, I don't want to talk about this because by t not talking no, about it, it didn't well, happen? Well, no, I think, you know, they, they're suppressing any kind of racial distinction. Yeah. They're saying, we, we don't deal in race. Sorry, yeah. we don't do that. So you're not getting anything from me on that because I, I, I do not think in those terms. Yeah, but things are blurred. I'll give you an example. One of my favorite stories that I imagine as a filmic kind of a scene is that my grandmother had a, had this not a relationship, but she enjoyed. She had. She liked. She had a crush on this white boy. She wanted to have a secret date with him, but obviously within the Chinese traditional family, she wasn't allowed to date outside of Chinese. First of all, so she had to sneak out. Where did she sneak out to? She used her black neighbor's house. Her black neighbor invited her to her house and set up a secret romantic dinner. It was a safe haven. Is that I'm interesting That's to blend? Much, yeah. The, the colors of this white boy going to a black house to see this Chinese she girl. safer there. <gasps> Gosh, it says so much. But what about, what about, suppose now a um, member of the family, a young woman, wanted to go out with a black guy. Yeah. And, oh. Uh, okay. There were. I have a couple and, of cousins who did marry. And maybe get married they in did. violation of the law, right, yes. at the time. Um, so how did the Chinese family react to that? Uh, were they okay with that? No, of course not. And even today, talk about the relevance today. I interviewed another cousin of mine. She said growing up she had black friends. She's my age, so we're talking only like 20, 30 years ago. Her father, when she brought her friend over to visit, after he left, the father like cleaned, sanitized the sofa after he left. <laughs> We laugh, but That's it's really in the green scary. Book. Remember that? The, the fellow threw the glasses away. The, the, the black guys yes. drank from the glass. Exactly. He threw the glasses away. Exactly. And it's real today. This is the scary part. It's so relevant. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the question is whether this is over. So let me, let me update you. Do you think you. it's reversing? Do you think we're going backwards in time in terms of Yes, I do. And, and I think, uh, sorry, I, I don't mind saying this in public. I think it's because Trump has yes. unleashed it. Yeah. Trump has, has given license to that, given permission. And, pe and people, um, you know, who are at that level, <laughs> yeah. you know, they take the license and, and they go to racism. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, I just wonder if you could update us, uh, uh, that, because you went there and you looked at it how it is now 
Yes. I mean, you're trying to find out what it was like then. Yes. How is it now? What's it like now? You know, I don't sense that type of discrimination when I'm there. But then again, everything is separate. And, and for me, even the process of filming there, I question, like, when I go into this uh, African-American museum where I interview uh, the black community, am I the outsider? And do I have the right to ask them these questions? If I were black, how does that affect how they answer the question? Or how, if I were white, would they even open the doors for me to ask these questions? So it's very relevant even in my process. It's really interesting. So, how, yeah, so you felt you felt some resistance on no, that? No, actually, no. I, I well, feel it's you though. <laughs> you know, because because you. Yeah. What's that mean? Yeah, well, you know, when I let me I'm not, tell you a I'm little not... about Crystal. <laughs> she was a beauty queen in oh, California. Oh God, stop that! Sorry, I said that. And 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 then she spent a lot of time in Asia as a celebrity, a newscaster, a, 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 a radio host, a television host. So she's been everywhere. She's a global person. Um, and uh, you know, and and so when you you're different. Sorry, <laughs> you're, you're different. Okay. You're, you're you're completely mm, you know. So it's the way you approach globalized. something, right? And so I think if you talk to me, yeah. and I'm in the South, make me a a holly skinhead in the South. If you talk to me, I'm going to feel that level of confidence that you have. You you get in my face right away, and you're able to articulate views that maybe other people would be reserved about, or not see beyond certain. Frameworks. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think when you go down there, you're going to get a different reaction than Maybe. somebody else. Well, that's why I think it's kind of groundbreaking work to be able to have a conversation between the Chinese and the black community about how racism kind of played out in their lives during that era and how it reflects on where we are today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I really wonder uh, when my wife and I were thinking about making a trip, you know. Uh, this is way you want to go down south? <laughs> we, we, we've been married 50 years. Yeah, yeah um, that's great. And uh, we, 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 you know, we were thinking about where to go. And one yeah. of the places that came up in our discussion was, should we go to the south? And she's Japanese, my wife. Yes. And she said, no, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to find out. I don't want to know about it. Yeah. I don't want to have the risk of people treating me you know, in a racial way. You see? I don't want that. Yeah. We, we, we stay isolated in places because we fear that, because we know it exists. Yeah, we know it, uh, yeah. doesn't it? Yes. I mean, the South is, is full of this kind of yeah. stuff. And, and query, you know, we were talking with John David and last hour about how civil wars, including especially our civil war, don't end. They're, yeah. they're baked in. Yes. <laughs> and they stay with you. And so this, this kind of mm, cultural problem stays, stays baked in in the U.S. And I guess the question is, how do you, how do you solve that? And maybe the answer is you, you kind of ignore negative things. Uh, you play above the noise. I think you need to disrupt. I think you need to open up those uncomfortable conversations and keep talking about it. So I hope when my documentary full one comes out, we can talk about it again. Yeah. But I think, you know, we're at a t You know, I, I'm sorry I'm disrupting you, and I'm disrupting my own show, but we need to... <laughs> <laughs> we need to stop it because I have like a few minutes. I need to disrupt you more with some more disruptive concepts. Well, tell us, tell us the takeaway on, on your project. Okay. What are you trying to show? Uh, how are you trying to show it? We don't have enough information about that yet. Well, you can check out my website. It's under www.crystalclock.com. Yeah. It has all the information on my film. It's called Not Black and White. And it's basically a feminist um, lens into the segregated uh, South. And so please check it out. And I will be sharing my project as it um, progresses, because I think it's important. So what's the great lesson? You know, if, if, I, if I thought about the Green Book, I could come up with yeah. what the great lesson was. What about your project? Um, like I said, you need to disrupt. You need to see it from outside. So from, from a female lens, we'll learn history through those small stories that I'm exploring. Yeah, what, what, tell me something I didn't know about it. That you're learning, that you're going to express. I'll you're, tell you. You're more, holding you know back. What? I know you're holding because back. Because this takes a whole nother interview. We we are out of time, so <laughs> I want to just leave that thought with you. I'm glad you're asking for more, Jay. I want to thank you so much for your time, but I like we just don't have enough for this loading. But don't go away. I have a quick break, and I have like a special guest who's going to disrupt us with some more feminist thinking for just a little bit. Okay, don't go away. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, 
we want to teach you about those things in our industry that you know may be a little outside of your experience so please join me because security matters aloha and aloha my name is calvin griffin the host of hawaii in uniform and every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring in the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back to Quok Talk. Why is this not over? Because I told you, I kept saying the word disruptive because today is a very disruptive topic. Disruptive thinking ticks disruptive guests. And so after Jay and me talking about um, historical disruptions, I have this feminist disruptor who's in town, who is here for a marathon, she's here for a music gig, and she has a lot to say about the, powering, the empowering uh, voice of a female. Mm. And, and so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Karen, she, Madam Gandhi, who mm. is this disruptive thinker who is a musician uh, by career choice, mm -hmm. I believe, but very, very educated and intelligent and rebellious in her views of the world. So mm -hmm. thank you for coming. Oh, it's Madam a pleasure. Gandhi. Actually, when I ran the London Marathon um, a couple years ago and the story went viral, it was Think Tech Hawaii oh. who had first found the story, one of the early folks who got on board. Oh, wow. And I called in and did an interview about a month after the story went viral, which is how I even found out about you all. So, so thank let's you for recap it. Having What's, your ear to the post. Thank you. What was this marathon and what does it mean to be a free, bleeding? marathon runner? Well, I guess in the moment I, I sort of discovered what it means. Um, I was at the start line of the London Marathon in 2015 and it was my first race and I realized that I was about to be on my cycle. And I, I remember kind of evaluating my options like any of us who have been caught unprepared on our cycle might experience. And I was like, you know, a pad is not going to be good for 26 miles. Um, a tampon it didn't seem comfortable either. There's no privacy to change it out on yeah. a marathon course. Um, I didn't have a cup. And so I kind of felt like, wow, it's so problematic that none of us have even talked about these issues publicly. You know, people exchange um, ideas about running all the time. And so I felt a little bit disempowered in that moment. I was like, what am I going to do? I've trained for a year. I don't want to let this go. So I decided to just go for it and run bleeding freely. And I felt like that was, for me, the best choice in that moment. And I was like, you know, I used to play the drums for MIA, and her work inspired me. I was like, bleeding anywhere for 26 miles um, is a punk rock move, if you ask me. <laughs> That's pretty um, radical. I mean, so yeah, the more, the, the more I ran, um, honestly, it was a really freeing and beautiful, comfortable race. And, and I did a great job. You know, we, I ran with my two friends. We crossed the finish line. But when I crossed the finish line, I wanted to write about this experience. And but I wanted to write. How did people know? Did people know? Were you like literally bleeding, like as it was a dripping down your leg kind of thing? Um, it, <laughs> Sorry I for had, the gritty No, so I wore an amazing matching breast cancer care pink oh, orange God. outfit because I had raised a bunch of money for breast cancer care. Good. And I, I mean, honestly, it just looks like a kind of a simple stain. Um, it just looks like a simple stain. And I think that's also part of destigmatizing. Even so many folks who don't bleed don't know kind of what the experience is like and exactly. how, what it even looks like. So. When I crossed the finish line, I wrote about the experience on my own personal blog. But I think maybe it was the combination of writing and then the radicalness of it. But then the eliteness of it. I mean, how can you shame a marathon runner? That's the that's where the mm -hmm. power lie. And I kind of knew that. Right. And so when I wrote about this, I wrote about how it was also a privileged position for me to even choose how I wanted to run that race and bleed freely. And millions of women and girls and people who bleed around the world do not have that same choice. It's expensive to take care of yourself. In the past 500 years, there's only been three innovations with regards to women's periods, as opposed to the thousands and thousands that exist for sort of men's health and men's care. Um, when it comes to women's health, we tend to put our own needs at the bottom of the sort of yeah. totem pole. Um, and I think it's also about looking at how those products are taxed as a luxury item. Yeah, that's so crazy. When, um, we talked about feminine hygiene on, a, uh, on a, my previous show few weeks ago and you know there is there is such a lack of respect for the the obvious kind of needs that we have as women so your period disrupted mm. your marathon and in a way you used that to mm. disrupt how people kind of conceive how we definitely and I think are. you know for anybody watching one takeaway that I would hope that anyone would listen is um, sometimes when we're brave just for ourselves without the intention of being brave for anybody else you have enormous power to make change in the world. And I wasn't trying to do that for anybody else except for me to cross the finish line in a way that felt good. 
And in doing so, it started this viral global conversation about how we treat menstruation and stigma in various parts of the world. How do you use that in your music? Um, lyrically, you know, I have a song, uh, The Future is Female, and one of the lines is, um, you know, we've, the, the system must make room for all that we do. We've been bleeding each month till we gave birth to you. You know, it's just, it's just facts. And so all this stigmatization, it doesn't even make sense logically. It's just, it's just a beautiful part of the human uh, anatomy. Um, so that's definitely one way. And then I think it's about teaching confidence. Like, I really felt confident as a marathoner. I don't know if I could have had that same bravery in another scenario, but I knew that there was power in the fact that I was doing this elite thing. So how can someone from the sidelines point and laugh? I'm like, why don't you come try to run 26 miles? And similarly, women and people who bleed all around the world are doing amazing things on our cycle. And on top of that, we have to be quiet about it. And on top of that, we have to yeah. suffer. W how did that happen? Yeah. It's ridiculous. We yeah. should actually be celebrated as such fierce uh, femmes that we can be doing something that's painful and difficult, but also living our daily life. Right. It how do we do that, though? How, how can we do that? I think the this? simplest step is for each of us to take responsibility for our own sphere of influence. So instead of being quiet when you talk about your cycle, Talk about it comfortably and with elegance and with simplicity. Like, hey, I'm in pain today. And instead of lying and say you're in pain because of a fever or because mm. of an illness, being open. You know, I'm on my cycle today. I don't feel so comfortable. Even for me, I'm on my own journey learning about my own moodiness and owning mm. it instead of letting other people make fun of us and, and put us down for it. Instead, I manage my own emotions. I say, oh, yeah. I'm going to have a great race today, or I'm going to have a great day today because I'm on this part of my cycle. Or I might be self-aware, and when I'm with my team, I might say, hey, guys, like, I'm a, I'm a little bit uncomfortable today because right. of my cycle, but I'm here, and I want to do my best, and, and just know that. You and know? to be able to talk to people about it, you know, all genders together, because it's all relevant to everybody. Definitely. I think another step that you can take beyond just destigmatizing verbally is participate in donating products to your local homeless shelter or to your local prison system. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday, um, every fourth Sunday of the month in downtown Los Angeles, we walk a bunch of homeless care packages of menstrual products to different women and people who bleed in the community. And that's really important um, because obviously those folks don't have access to those products, but now they do. Yeah. And everyone deserves to live in dignity. Yeah, and that's great that you brought that up because we just did this drive at UH with you there um, talking uh, to our students. And they were really happy to donate their products. We put them in handbags and we gave it to Rainbow Family 808, which is an organization that supports LGBT homeless teens. Mm. And we take it for granted. I mean, homeless is a huge issue here. Mm. But well, let's, let's break it down to the smaller things about why, why is a teenager homeless to begin with and exactly. what is their life about? And it's really huge, important things to talk about. Now, you are performing here. You mm -hmm. have a gig yes. at the hotel. Let's talk yes. about that. Um, I'm really uh, stoked. Uh, Nella Media Group, which was the sort of the force behind Flux Magazine and Lay Magazine, which are here local in Hawaii, um, they brought me out for a show. They saw my show in New York City and were super amped up about it. And they said, we want you to come do our Christmas party. Oh, wow. So for that show, I put together really something special where it's going to be a seven-piece all-female band cool. of half my band coming in from L.A. tomorrow and then half local musicians. So wow. we're going to have a band um, and cover a couple of Hawaiian songs as well as play my own original music. And, and celebrate at the Alohilani Hotel on Friday. Friday. And then we um, have a flyer, I think, we can show people. Definitely. That's this Friday. Yep. Actually, and so this one, the one that you're showing right now, is a gig this evening, tonight, oh, Tuesday, oh. December 11th, 6 to 8 p.m. It's going to be a talk followed by a DJ set at Bar 35. Where's um, Bar 35? Is it in Chinatown? You tell me. I'm the, I'm the new person here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just down the street from here. OK, so if you guys are downtown, Bar 23? Yep, 25. 25. 35. Bar 35. Bar, bar 35, sorry. What time? 6 to 8 p.m. That's tonight? Yes. With a talk? Yes. And then this Friday is the amazing gig with the seven piece women's band. band. Yes, exactly. That is so cool. And for anybody watching, just DM me on my Instagram and we'll try to get you What's into your Instagram? Show, at Madam Gandhi. Tell me why your name is Madam Gandhi. Well, my last name is Gandhi, and for Madam, you know, I, if, when I spent a lot of time in India growing up, I would see a lot of folks being referred to as Madam. Okay, Madam, come here, Madam. Yes, this Madam. And there was this sort of like built-in, um, elegant female respect that I really liked. And um, for me, it's about uh, instead of women trying to masculinize in order to be perceived as strong and as as uh, intelligent leaders, I'm really interested in us as women. Uh, leading from our femme and leading from the divine femininity in all of us and sort of if developing what that even means. And so I liked the word madam because it has this inherent sort of female 
leadership energy, much like a Oprah or sort of like the mother of the house. Okay. Um, but taking those same principles and applying them to to other spheres of influence, I thought I thought was really uh, powerful. So that's kind of a very strong maternal image there. But how about how does color come into play? We were just talking. I was talking to Jay about you know racism and the implications of of color and women that combination. Mm. And so how do you how does that work in your life mm. and, and your approach? Does that affect the way you, your voice is? Um, I explain, the like, question is so big, what do you I mean? I know, no, no, well, you so mean? you're of Indian descent. Yes. Growing up in LA, but you were born in New York. Yep. I feel like through your music, there's a lot of strong traditional things in there. I feel mm, the music. Yes, yeah, the definitely. way you move, there's just, it's in your blood. I and mean, it's really quite cool. So, you know, you embody this, this, this concept of cultural identity and, and, and weaving it into your feminist mm, approach. So yes. how does that work for you? You know what, I, I love that you asked me that question because when I was younger, I actually felt bad that sometimes I connected more with Brazilian and African music than I did with my own Indian heritage huh. music, whether it was tabla or Bollywood music. Um, now, later in my journey, I, I love it. But I think it's important for each of us to be super honest about who we are yes. and honest about our identity. And I wanted, to, instead of saying, oh yeah, I love Bollywood, even if that was a lie, I'd rather say, I love the drumming in Bhangra music. And I love the dancing that I see in the Punjabi region where my father is from because it's so joyful and, and, and uplifting and equal. You know, it feels equal between the men and the women in a, mm, in a way. I'm sure it's not, but <laughs> at, at least the women play a, a prominent role in both the dancing and oftentimes sometimes even the drumming. And um, I felt in Bollywood to this day, so many of the traditional gender roles are very, very stringent and in place and not evolving. And so I don't want to celebrate that because I reject it. I don't like it. And, um, and I think we have to be brave enough to say that's OK. And in us being honest about what we love from our cultures and what we actually want to evolve, it teaches the next generation to feel safe to do the same. And how was the influence of your parents mm. kind of affecting of your mm. feminist approach on life? Was your dad kind of encouraging you to do the things you wanted to do? I think, you know, my dad's feminism looked more like almost raising me like a little boy in a way, you know, <laughs> encouraging me to always um, go and drum in public spaces or like be uh, fearless to take risk and to go for it and to be doing a bunch of activities all the time and be really good at whatever it is that I was doing, you know? And my mom's feminism looked more like really asserting herself. She was very good at asserting herself in spaces where she felt like she was being disrespected and very unapologetically. You know, if uh, we had a family dinner and the waiter or waitress placed the check um, towards my dad instead of towards my mom, she would shut that down. Oh. She'd be like, it's the 21st century. Like, why don't you place that right in the middle and, and I'll take care of it. Ah, and, and so just moments like that where she felt um, very, very comfortable asserting herself taught me to do the same. And that's why the, the message of Own Your Voice is on my turtlenecks that I sell at my show and, and very um, integral to my, to my work. And so to leave the audience with some takeaway, do you want to leave it with that concept of owning your voice? Give, give us a little shout out of what you mean by that. Definitely. I think the marathon story taught me to own my voice. I think being two years at Harvard Business School, which is like the breeding ground of the capitalist That's patriarchy. That's so ironic that you were there. <laughs> it is. But sometimes we have to learn how to fight fire with fire. It's yes. like when I know how bad things are, it allows me to reject what we perceive as like power and privilege and actually say, no, this is, this is not teaching something that I necessarily ascribe with. It teaches me how to live in this world if I want to, but it also teaches me uh, what's selfish and, and greedy in, in a lot of ways. Wow. Um, so I think Own Your Voice is about being brave enough to speak your truth, to say when something makes you feel uncomfortable, to call something out that you don't think is quite right, and to be brave enough that you might be wrong, but that you might be right. And that bravery might trigger somebody else to feel safe enough to say something. Similarly to how we've seen movements like Me Too take off or yeah, Black Lives it's Matter. It's so relevant. Madam Gandhi, if you could just take a little essence of what she just said there, you're gonna take away a lot. Remember her beautiful performance here tonight at Bar 2035 yes, at 6, six to, to eight. 8. And this Friday at the Aloha Lani Resort, 8 p.m. Okay, thank you so much. Crystal, Wishing what a you the pleasure. best, best performance and experience here in Hawaii. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love. Okay, thanks for tuning in to Quok Talk. See you next time. Go see the show.